Hello, and welcome back to the School for Writers podcast. We are talking today about debt. Now, you might be asking, what does debt have to do with being a writer? Well, here's the thing. A majority of people in the United States and in North America in general have a crap ton of debt. And that includes you, writers. That includes creatives. In fact, creatives are statistically more likely to go into debt because we don't believe that we're worthy of making money, of paying our bills, and of being financially free. Which is why I brought my friend and the amazingly wonderful Erin Sky Kelly here to talk to you about how you can get the hell out of debt. Erin Sky Kelly teaches people how to transform their lives through their relationship to health, money, and each other. She does this through keynote speaking, online courses, and hanging with her, what she calls her nerd crew, which I love that term, the Achievement Club. Now, in Erin's own words, she says that she has terrible stage fright, general human awkwardness, and yet she manages to sell out her own three-day conferences called Transformation Weekend over and over and over again. Now approaching its 10th year, the Transformation Weekend has impacted thousands of participants through a step-by-step process Erin created specifically for goal achievement and mastery, a process that she's going to talk about today in our interview. Erin Sky Kelly wrote a book called Get the Hell Out of Debt, and today we're going to talk a little bit about the book writing process, but we're also going to talk about what it means to shift your mind from thinking that I'm not worthy to make money, that that's only for those people over here, and turn instead to, I deserve to financially thrive. I deserve to have a life and a career and a world that I like. We're also gonna talk about how having massive amounts of debt can actually be really creatively stifling for you and how working towards making more money as a writer can actually help you write better and be able to explore your creative goals and dreams with more freedom. This is an episode that I'm really passionate about because I really believe that you deserve to thrive both creatively and financially as a writer. And I'm so excited today to have Erin Sky Kelly on here sharing her wonderful tips with you. Let's get to that interview. Do you dream of building a thriving writing career? When were you able to both make the time and the money that you need to be a writer? I've got your back. I am so excited to let you know about this amazing new program that's coming called the School for Writers Academy. A membership program, School for Writers is going to consistently help you have the accountability you need and the camaraderie you need to merge both the craft and the career side of writing. Virginia Woolf once famously said that a woman needs both money and a room of her own to write. And I am here to support you in creating both the money, the career side of writing, and the career side of creating content, of being a storyteller, of somebody who's creating copy and content and stories and writing online, and the craft side. How do you make your writing better? When you have that room of your own and you have that time that you've carved out, what do you do with it? What do you write? How do you make that time? How do you do the craft side of it? I have my whole life longed for one location that I could come and talk with people about both the craft and the career side of writing. And now I have created that space just for you. It's called the School for Writers Academy, and it opens June 2021. But here's the deal. We're only going to let in a certain amount of people. So if you want to be one of those people, you need to go right now to schoolforwriters.com slash academy and get on that wait list. This is going to be the ultimate amazing way to make sure that you find both the time and the money and the place to write. We're here to support you thrive in every aspect of your career. So check out schoolforwriters.com slash academy to get yourself on that wait list so you don't miss a spot. Once again, that's schoolforwriters.com slash academy and that link, it's in your show notes. Welcome, Erin. I am beyond excited to have you here today and to be chatting with you. You are a one of the people I love so, so much in this world. So I just did your formal intro. Tell us a little bit about who you are and how you exist within this world and what you put out in it. Oh my gosh. I am so excited to talk to you because you're one of my favorite people. And Yay. what's interesting is I, as a 
as a horrible writer who've watched you as an excellent writer. And I'm, I'm sort of in the middle of this uh, book journey right now. I have a book being published this summer, um, but sort of like watching myself through this process is like the most humbling thing because I know amazing, excellent writers like you who like are just creative geniuses. And so I'm doing that thing where, you know, I think pretty much all writers do where it's a little bit exciting, but a lot of cringe and a lot of like really having to hold yourself in this position of the, you know, the art versus business piece right now. And I'm just, I'm floundering. Like, <laughs> just, I mean that, like the book isn't released, but it's in the hands of a, a couple of readers. And so I'm trying not to crumble and worry about what other people think. I'm trying to just serve. And so that is where I'm at right now. That is, that is entirely my life is like this ball of both excitement and just horrific cringe in a nutshell. If that isn't, if you didn't just every, I don't care where you are, if this is your first book or your 500th book, every author I talk to when their book's about to go to the world, they have the same ecstasy uh, crisis. I wish we didn't because I read other people's books and I'm like, you are a genius. How did you not know you're a genius? But I, it's just this weird thing of like, you're putting your heart out there. Like you're exposing parts of yourself, you're, you're sharing. And it's just, it's so tough. Yeah. People only knew how tough it was. <laughs> don't listen to her it's easy you can do it I I believe in you <laughs> well that part is true and that I think that's where true. you're such a good champion for people right I think that's why the work that you do is so necessary because I think without somebody like you to say hey it's awesome keep going like this is all part of the process I think it could be really easy to take yourself out of the game like think about all of the unwritten books out there because somebody doesn't have somebody like you to say come on, let's take this across the finish line. You're going to feel so good when it's done. Hmm. Thank you. And I feel that same way with, with me too. Like I have a lot of unfinished books in me, which is why I do what I do, because I know that if I, somebody who has been a professional writer for so long decades now have this many unfinished manuscripts, then, then the average person who isn't paid to do this work is probably has even more in them. So yeah. Yeah. I, well, I'm glad that you finished yours because I am one of those people who got an advance. This is this is the only reason I do my job is I get advanced reader copies. Ugh. They're called ARCs. And then I get to feel like really special and like I'm fancy for getting it before. Everybody. I love it too. I love it's being an so ARC reader. Good. Yeah. So I got an ARC of your book. And I have to say, I love that it's a combination it, I really did love it. And I've read a lot. You know me, we we met through a world where I was reading a ton of financial books I had to at the time. And I liked that it, it felt accessible. It felt like, oh, this isn't some multimillionaire white man telling me to also become a multimillionaire white man. It's like this person who also knows what it's like to struggle with consumer debt and wants to help me understand the money mindset that gets me there and the practical steps to get out of that. But before we go into all that, I want to go into all that. I want to go into so much. We're going to talk a lot today, folks, about the money mindset of both the publishing part of writing and the money mindset part of writing, because that's really important. That's how you ditch that starving artist cliche and thrive. But first, I'm going to ask you the first question that I ask everybody who comes on my podcast. Well, since like the eighth episode, when I came up with this question and it's why writing? Oh man, I knew you were going to ask this question and I I don't (laughs) have an articulate answer. It's tough because I'm only medium smart. Like I'm not somebody who set out to be a writer. I, you know, I did okay in English in high school and all of that, but I just think reading is the reason I write because I know that if I ever want to learn something, sure, I can pay $5,000 to go to a seminar and give up a bunch of time in my life and maybe implement some of it when I come back. But a book is a resource. Like there's richness in a book and you can pay the same price. You can pay $5,000 to go to a seminar. You can pay $18 for a book, but you have the book as a resource for life. And so the accessibility part that you're talking about is really what I wanted to hit home. People who um, struggle financially, books are accessible. They can get them in a library. They can get them donated. It's just, it's just an easier way to transmit information, especially about something as important as money. So it was really about the serving. Like I decided that one of the ways I could serve people was to, to write this book. Definitely not writing because I have this like amazing creative talent. My husband is also a writer and he does have this creative talent and he writes these 
beautiful, lovely sentences. And then in my book, I have the word twat waffle. And I'm like, you know, my writer's like, Aaron, you can't say twat cunt in a book. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, I am not a writer, but I think that that's important to know it. If, if you want to be a writer, it literally is about what is your message. And just, it's, it's a vehicle to get the message across. Okay. Let's go back to twat waffle because we can <laughs> cuss on this. We're going to just have an E next to this particular episode. Where uh, did I miss twat waffle or did oh, I have to get it out? You know, it's in the acknowledgements there. Uh, okay. Yeah. It's in the acknowledgement. Only I don't because... think there were acknowledgements in my arc. Oh, maybe not. Maybe I not. didn't see the acknowledgements yeah. page. I missed twat waffle. Folks, you this home. is the greatest thing about being wa- a writer is you get to use words like twat waffle. <laughs> so it's like, and it's not like I'm acknowledging a twat waffle. I was acknowledging a friend who helped me through a situation with a twat waffle. And so it was like, it just was like one of those moments where um, it, to me, the acknowledgements was the most important part of the book because getting a book deal and all of that. I know people get excited about that and that sounds very glamorous and all of that, but really the res- like that was the result of all of the people who've ever believed in me before I got that deal, right? I don't think any of us do anything on our own. So the acknowledgements to me was really important. So yes, it has, the, the it did pass all the edits, was Twat Waffle made it in the book. Um, and so did a few other fun creative words, but that is, you're right. It's part of the fun of being a writer is you, you get a little bit of license with some things. I, if you have the right editor and publisher. Right. I'll say that. Yes. I love that. I think that's one of the reasons I have had so many people that write erotica and write about queer issues um, decide to self-publish because they're like, I can use whatever term I want. It's like twat waffle has a whole different meaning in an erotica <laughs> book. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So let's just dive right in. I, I First off, I love that reading is the reason I write because I think... That's true for me. So much of what I do, the books I put out in the world, like I charge premium prices for my services. And I also want accessible ways that anybody at any, at any financial area could get access to whatever I'm saying. So I love that a book is something that you can find access to a lot more easily than say a coaching call or something like a big coaching program or something like that. Yeah. Let's dive right into your book. So tell us about this book. It's called Get the Hell Out of Debt. And as somebody who my program's called Write Your Friggin' Book Already. So I love a good cussing. <laughs> Obviously, I love a good cussing. I'm like here for it. Taylor. I love it. Um, tell me about Get the Hell Out of Debt. Tell me about your book. And I'd love to start with the story of the book. So w- how did this start? How, where did you decide I'm going to write a book about debt? Well, I was in a shit ton of it is sort of what happened. And so I had started out um, working in broadcasting. That's my background. And my grandfather at the time had said to me, he, he meant it very lovingly, but he's like this, you know, 300 pound Lebanese man. And he said, um, you know, if you want to write a book or sorry, if you want to uh, be on TV, which I didn't, I just wanted to be behind the scenes. But he's like, if you want to be on TV one day, you're going to be fat and ugly and nobody's going to hire you. And so you need to have a plan B. And what he meant was, you know, he he was quite progressive for his age as much as that sounds awful. What he meant was uh, you really have to be responsible for your own success because you don't want to put your career in the hands of somebody else that's going to determine whether or not you can make it. And that was very much what the broadcasting world was like. So I started to invest in real estate and I ended up doing this thing where I was, doing broadcasting. I was living this really amazing dream of working at MTV, which was my big goal. But I also was having these rental properties and running this real estate on the side. And then eventually owned a mortgage brokerage and whatever. So I was like surrounded by debt all the time. And debt was so normal for me that I didn't realize how quickly I was getting behind because I had this appearance that I had lots of money. I had all these assets. I just didn't seem to have any cash flow. And it wasn't until one day I sort of tallied it all up. And I thought, what is going on here? Why can't I sort of get ahead? And I had $2.1 million in debt. And I was like, oh no, like that's too late to find out. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? It's like, that was pretty far down the line before I realized how much trouble I was in. So um, I, I just had to figure out a way out of it. And the process was so frustrating for me because I, you know, would meet other people who were in the financial industry and they would say things like, oh, here, let's just borrow and consolidate and we'll reduce this interest by paying a lower interest here. And well, and I just kept getting in more and more debt. This consolidation thing wasn't working, all these fancy. And I thought, I just, I got to just pay this off. I got to figure this out. And so I 
literally step by step figured it out. And that's then, you know, how I managed it. And suddenly all these people were coming to me, people in the industry, financial industry, women, particularly um, people from um, different parts of the population that are marginalized would come and whisper and be like, how, how do I do this? How do like, really tell me the truth? How do I do this? And so I started to teach them. And then after a while we had so much success, uh, you know, people kind of take notice. And so then the book came about because it's like, this is a, an easier way to reach people. If I just spend a few months of my life writing all this out, it can live in perpetuity to help other people. So really it was, it came about because of a need that I had. I was tired of listening to middle-aged white men in suits tell me <laughs> what I needed to do in order to pay off debt. I was tired of watching segments of the population be told by again, not to knock the middle-aged white men, uh, but you know, that this is a matter of personal responsibility. And if you just take action, but that's not true there, the system is designed to keep certain people poor. Like it, it, you can have all the get up and go you want, but it, if the system isn't allowing you to break, like, so there was just things like that, where I thought I got to remove the shame here. I got to remove this stigma. We have to start talking about it. Women particularly um, need to become financially free. We, we end in, end up in relationships that aren't safe for us. We end up in jobs that we hate. We end up in all kinds of situations that make it hard to live our dreams and go after what we want when we're stuck in debt. And so it was really just like, a, I had, I didn't have a choice. I just, I thought I can't, I can't not write the book. And so that's how the book came to be. I can't not write the book. So that's how the book came to be. That right there is the key to finding a book that you're going to actually finish a book that you're going to be proud of a book. You're going to be happy to market. I couldn't just not write it. Like I had to write it. I love that. I also love a bunch of what you said, but you were going into this idea of money mindset into what it means to live in a culture that normalizes debt. But you started that conversation with this normalization that we've done that that if you're going to go into the arts at all, only certain people get to thrive in them. Right. Yeah. Only certain looking people get to thrive in the arts. Only people with a certain amount of talent get to thrive in the arts. And then the rest of you are going to be starving and tortured. And that, or if you're only good, if you're like that starving, tortured genius that like ends up dead in the gutter. You know, we have this idea that we sell people that if you want to be a writer, you have to starve and be tortured. And if you want to have any success in life, you're going to have a ton of debt. Like I, I can't tell you how many times I go to these business seminars or these writer seminars. I remember when I first decided to self-publish my book, Body Love, 10 Steps to Profoundly Loving Your Body, everybody told me just open a new credit card and put all the expenses on that and you'll get it back someday. I'm like, yeah, but like, I don't want to do that. Like, and I did it. And I was very, very lucky that my book sold and sold at a high price. And I was able to get that back. But honestly, yeah, it's dangerous. It was, yeah. it was a gamble. It was a gamble that I made and I wouldn't have been able to make if I hadn't had some family support too and friend support and people, people in my life who could afford, I had to charge a lot for my book because of that, not normal prices. And so we have these, these ideas, all of these ideas, one that you're going to be starving and tortured if you're a writer or if you're anywhere in the arts or if that you're living in the world in general, you can, you don't get to thrive that women, people of color, queers, other people on the margins don't get to have the same structure of support and wealth, that it's only through other people and that that you have to go into debt to get there. Like I can't tell you how many times as I started my business, everyone's like, well, just get a loan, just go into debt, just get into loan. loan. I'm like, yes. And then what happens if my business isn't profitable? What happens to my life? And one of the last things I wanted to say in reflection to that is I actually have this sign up here. You can kind of see it right there. It says, nothing bad happens when women have more money. Yes. And so I would love to know about the like activist part of you because I feel like you're a money activist and maybe you don't identify with the activist term, but I feel you've talked a lot about serving. I feel like you're almost on a mission to encourage people, women in particular, Mm -hmm. to get a hold of their finances. So tell me about that mission, about how that service came about and, and how it plays out for you. Well, I just love, I got to get myself that quote because that is 
so awesome. And that is so I have an I extra one. It's a shout out to Alvest. Are you familiar with Alvest? Oh, uh, no, no. Alvest is this amazing organization that they help women understand how to invest in the markets. And they're mostly index fund, robo investing, but they help women. And their whole website has lots of amazing information for people as well. But when you join LVS and start investing with them, they send you a sign that says nothing bad happens when women make more money. So, oh my gosh, I'm going to have an extra one. Things. I'll send it to you. Yes. <laughs> and robo, all of that is great because that's like lower fees and it's like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, I have to learn everything. Okay. That's so cool. I didn't know. Thank you for that. That's so awesome. Um, the activist part of me, I think is, it's sort of started off just as like, you know, being a little helper, but I think whenever I would run into resistance, I, it, it fueled that, that fire even more, right? When you look globally at what happens to women, women are more likely to be in poverty. Women are more likely to, um, struggle. Women are more likely to be in debt. Women are more likely to work longer hours on average four years more in their lifetime than men. And that's in the developed world. Women are more likely to do housework plus work in, in societies where women are able to, like, it's just, it's harder, it's more difficult. And yet they're being sold in a lot of cases. Well, here's the quick, easy answer. And of course, if you are tired and you're exhausted and yes, then debt does appear like it's going to help. But in the long run, what happens is, of course, it just wears you down even more, makes you dependent on the system, makes you dependent on the debt. And so that activist part of me is really all about um, freeing women financially, because just like that quote says, women are not, when women have money, they tend to do good with it. We don't have an actual statistic for this. I wish we did like a global statistic that shows, but um, I, I rarely encounter a woman who isn't busy running a company or doing a business or, or having some income on the side where that money isn't going towards furthering the community, helping her children or other children being donated to a friend. When a GoFundMe appears, women are the first to usually donate when a, so it's just like this, it's, it's part of the, you know, and I guess it's not even just women. I suppose it's just anybody that wants to advance. Cause it, I have to be really careful there that I'm not just saying this is like a, a female gendered situation, like anybody that sort of identifies with that being oppressed financially, this will work for. It's just a matter of when we, when we are held to this debt position, we are constantly living our future lives to pay for something in the past. And maybe we really needed it. Maybe it was groceries. Maybe it was childcare. Maybe it was something, you know, who knows, maybe it was actually important. It wasn't just a trip to target and a, you know, new pair of Uggs. But regardless, the tools that we need in order to get out of it, out of that debt, are the same tools we use to build wealth. So why not then use those tools to build the wealth so that we can then free more women, especially those globally who don't have the ability, like because of their government systems or their cultures or whatever, to do the same for themselves. And so I just, I really have this belief deep down that when enough women become financially free, especially in the developed world, we will naturally, we will be the people who help free those other countries that for some reason, our governments and our, the systems that are in place now can't seem to figure out. Yeah. So Ooh. that's my so, TED talk. It was very not, it wasn't eloquent at all, but that's the fire in my belly story. <laughs> I think that we, I mean, I'm saying this as a writer. I think eloquence is overrated. Uh, you know, I I coached speakers on massive stages. <laughs> That's how you and I met. I've like yeah, I write yeah. books. I teach people how to be eloquent. And sometimes the best way to be eloquent is to speak from the fire in your belly. So I love that you spoke from the fire in your belly. And I love that you brought up this idea because it's a it's true. It's so true that people who are marginalized when they get money are way more often to invest in their community than yes. people who are who are born with privilege. Yes. And it's something that statistics, we don't have a global statistic, but statistics show time and time again, this is a stat I see over and over. This is why there are lots of micro lenders focusing solely on lending to women because mm -hmm. when you or educating women because these stu studies show that we tend to be like marginalized people tend to understand what it's like on the margins and want to help yes. their people, want to help people not on the margins in a way yeah. that people 
more in centralized in the in the community don't understand that because they haven't lived that experience and they haven't had to live that experience, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so I think that one of the things that I love what you're doing is you're giving people it felt easy. I know it's not easy, but it felt easy in reading your book. I was like, oh, okay. It doesn't have to be something that only people who have a degree in finance from Yale can do. <laughs> and you make it feel easy. So what is the first, um, I, I know that we can't actually, like everybody's going to have a different thing, but I would love to know like, what's the first mindset shift even? What's the oh. first step I need to do? To, yeah. To feel even worthy. Cause you're talking, I love in your book, you're like, okay, cool. Let's get you out of debt. And then let's build wealth. Let's make you a wealthy human who has resources to give to a community. And that reminded me when I, la- when I started law school, I felt really bad. Cause I felt like I was a sellout. I was like, Oh, I'm going to go to law school and I'm going to like start making money. I- I'm a sellout. And my friend told me, she's like, Lauren, we have enough broke dykes in the world. We need someone to fund the revolution. And you yes. didn't say those words, but you said something in your book. So I would just love to know, like, where do you start in funding the revolution? Oh my goodness. <laughs> where do you yeah. start? I often wonder, and I wonder what you think about this. Like, I I think about this sort of starving artist thing that you're talking about, the starving writer, this idea. I really believe that that is something that somehow through history started by the system because writers are storytellers. And if we let people tell their real stories, we can change the world. So there's this idea, I think, I don't know how you feel about it, but I just, I think when we can let go of that mindset and understand there's more power in the words than there is in the money, pardon me. And so when, when we can understand that the power of the storytelling and the power of unleashing whatever it is, whatever book it is that you haven't written yet, whatever book you're working on, you've got to get it out there because it can become a source of income, certainly, but more importantly, it can, you know, be part of this, like what you're talking about with this revolution, but without it, it's not a source of cash flow. while it's sitting inside you, it can't be a source of cash flow. So at the very minimum, you have to get it out. Now, I know writers who have written fiction books that then, you know, they just wanted to put out there because it's art. And then suddenly there's a movie deal and, a, you know, like there's, it, it's beyond what you can even imagine. But if the end of the road for you right now is just getting the book out there, that's a really great place to start because that story, the the, the money, the power is in that story. And so sharing it alone is the first sort of money mindset that you, you have to master, that there is value here, even if not for you, even if it's the people you're telling the story for or on behalf of or about, or the people you're trying to gather by the story or the empathy you're trying to generate. So, so that's the first shift I'd say that, that has to be made. The second piece about this worthiness, you know, I, I've never met a human that's felt worthy. I really haven't. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to recognize that when you feel unworthy, which you will, because you're human, when you feel unworthy, you're not alone. So those feelings of unworthiness are always going to be there. I don't know. I don't know anybody who feels worthy hundred percent of the time. And certainly we can, you know, quiet those demon noises, you know, that say those awful things to us now and then. I don't know. I just, there's like a, you are worthy because you're born and you're here and you're, you know, you absolutely are worthy, but I get that you're not going to feel that way all the time. And so trying to then make yourself feel worthy, I think is almost a waste of energy because I, I don't know how we win that battle. I don't know anybody who, I mean, you and I worked for the number one motivational speaker in the world, the most powerful, like, and, and does amazing service and does amazing things. But we would watch him come off stage sometimes and look at his partner and say, was that okay? Like, do you know what I mean? And I'm like, I can't believe you have moments of doubt, but that's what happens to every human, no matter what. And I think that's, a, I think it's normal. And I think if we just understand that the person you're sitting next to on the bus or the person you're sitting next to across the boardroom table has moments of unworthiness, then I think that's how you claim your worthiness in that shared spirit experience of unworthiness. Um, and then financially, I think it's one of those things that competence builds confidence. And so we just, you know, yeah, you start investing in yourself a little bit. You start putting a little money away for yourself. You start, and as you're watching that grow, then you, it reinforces that you can do this. So I don't know how to, again, I don't know how to eloquently answer that question, but I just think it's, 
it's the, like you say, the mind sh- the mindset shift is the most important part, but I think it starts with um, doing what it is you're put on this earth to do that is uniquely you. You <laughs> are a liar because <laughs> earlier you said you weren't eloquent. I'm and then you lied again and said that you didn't know how to answer that question. I'm just going to call you out as the liar here. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that with all love and respect. I think that you just, you know, three major shifts you just outlined. The first, that there is value in what you have to say and what you have to offer the world. Huge shift, massive, yeah. massive shift for writers. Two, claim your worthiness and that shared experience of feeling unworthy. I don't know a single author who loves everything that they do in their book. Right. Even if they're critically acclaimed, they do, they're like, I right. would change that sentence. <laughs> I would go back and redo that whole paragraph. So nobody <laughs> feels completely. So I love that like communal aspect of that. Like you're part of a human experience mm-hmm. and humanize it. And then three, competence builds confidence. Mm-hmm. And I love that, especially because I started building wealth and investing in myself and like in me being someone who had wealth by a hundred dollars a month. And yeah. some months that's all I can still do. But I bare minimum, I think of it like paying my taxes. I, I pay into that because I want my goal and mission in life is to help people ditch that starving, tortured artist cliche. So I have to do it yes. for myself. I have yes. to put that money aside. And I think when we think of it as like, I have to, then we can get to that. I am worthy of, like, I didn't, I still don't feel like I'm worthy of being a millionaire, but I have to put money aside because my goal one day is to be a millionaire kind of thing. Like get, you know, get there. Um, And what's so amazing is that then when you are, which you will be like by putting that little bit aside by saying you have to right? you know, paying yourself first, whatever you want to call it, that money mates. And it's like, you know, you got these little money bunnies. And so your little money bunnies are having sex and then they make more money bunnies and they make more money bunnies. And what happens is now you have the writer's dream, which is like, you don't ever have to withdraw any of that money, but the interest that that money is making is what you fuel your life on. And so now you can write without the stress of, you know, a job or a nine to five or whatever, like you can do what you want when you want, because the money that you were putting aside earlier on is mating and it's making more money bunnies for you to now live on. And so, yes, that's so, that's so critical that you start I, paying yourself first. Love calling it money bunnies because it makes more sense to me as someone who used to write about sex for a living. Uh, money bunny, like, oh yeah. So every dollar I put in there, it like starts having sex with my other dollars. Yes. The more dollars, like the longer those dollars are there, the longer I keep those dollars together, the more babies they're going to make. Yes, it's like a money or orgy is what it is. It's like a, orgy. a it's just I've had one of those. They're awesome. <laughs> Not really, but it sounds like the kind of thing I would eventually in my life do. New life goal, money orgy. <laughs> yes. The funniest. Yes. So what are some basic Obviously, people need to get your book. And I don't just say that because I love you. I have you on here because I love the book, not just because I love you. I think that what you're doing, I think that making marginalized people and especially creatives in my world, act, giving them easy access to financial tips and tools is so important to me. So your book is full of them. But I would love to know what's like What's like one to three really just practical things that we can do right now to start building wealth as creatives, as writers, as we're building our writing careers? Assuming we have debt or don't have debt? Ooh, that's a good question. Let's assume we have debt because let's be real. I don't know anybody who doesn't. (laughs) Okay. So the idea- I mean, I guess I know probably in theory, no people who don't, but the average person I work with has lots of debt. (laughs) Has lots of debt. All right. Well, we want to do our best to get out of that as soon as possible because, so like, let's imagine, let's go back to our money bunnies analogy. So let's imagine you have red bunnies and that represents debt, right? If you put like two red bunnies in your backyard in- a couple of months, you're going to have a whole lot of red bunnies. And so what's happening with your debt is it's compounding and compounding, compounding, it's making more money bunnies. So you have to very humanely remove the red bunnies from your life. <laughs> I think this because... is about to get sad, folks. It's <laughs> poor bunnies. They have if a lot start... of rabbit feet and rabbit fur coats laying around. <laughs> if you start introducing green bunnies, the, the red bunnies are going to take them over anyway. So it's really important that we 
call that this is getting super gross, but you know what I mean? We gotta, we gotta, we gotta remove the red bunnies. I'm not a geneticist. Maybe somebody will like, you know, <laughs> correct me on all of this, but this is just so a gonna, metaphor people. We're gonna, <laughs> not actually killing bunnies. <laughs> we're gonna get rid of the debt. We're gonna get rid of the, the, the debt even becomes like this emotional energetic anchor as well. Right. So it becomes an anchor to past decisions when you want to try and move your life forward. And so we really want to be get into this position where we are consumer debt free. That's so critical to building future wealth. And so there's, we do that step-by-step. Step. We, you know, there's a number of different methods. I outlined four different ones in the book that you can take, whichever one makes the most sense for you. And if you're a math person, there's, you know, some methods that work for you. And if you're like me and you're only medium smart and in math class, you were busy doodling and passing notes to the person that you had a crush on, then there's other methods that work for non-math people too, but they're all behavior driven. So we want to, we don't want to try and make you fit math. We want to make your budget fit your lifestyle so that it's, it's easy for you. It's not like a grind. And then from there, we truly start to build wealth. And what that means is you're going to pick, um, you know, a stream of income. I love the one that you were talking about, right. With index funds and, and, you know, you can learn about just pick the one that interests you the most of all the different types of things you can invest in. Again, there's a bunch listed in the book, but you pick the one. And I would, if I were you, I would work with that company that you're working with. That sounds amazing. Like I, I'm, I'm going to research them. I'm going to send them a copy of the book. I'm all over. I'm like, let me work with you. I love your philosophy. And their CEO, Sally Krychek would love that. So you should definitely look into her. She's amazing. The company's called Elvest and we'll have a link to it in the Elvest. Right next Um, to the link to get your book because I definitely agree with this into that. So if I was a client of Elvest, what I would do is, you know, that hundred dollars that you're putting away, no matter what, I would make that, that non-negotiable, right? That's, that's as soon as money hits my account, a hundred dollars is removed and it's going to Elvest. And then I would go the rest of the month doing what's called the squeeze method, which is really looking for like little bits of money here and there to feed your money bunnies. And so you know, when you sell something, let's say that you're not using anymore, you sell it on a buy and sell and you get $30 for it. Boom. It automatically goes into Elvest. If you are, you know, uh, you acquire a new client that was over and above what you would normally achieve in a month, all of that excess money, boom, is going to go to Elvest. And so these little bits of money add up, they start to mate and they start to make more money. And it creates this amazing, beautiful snowball or avalanche or all of them. I don't know why all the money people use weather related terminology, but they do. And so it, it, I, it's just like, it's in the little bits. And oftentimes what happens is when we're starting out, we think when I get a new job, I'll start investing. When I get a raise, I'll start investing. When if we're waiting for something to happen, when in actuality, you can make it happen right now with just little tiny bits compounded over time. And so that's literally all I would do. I would get rid of the debt. I'd get the hell out of debt first. And then I would start really getting a hold of my income that's coming in and money that's going out. And I'd be paying attention to that. And then the third thing I do is I'd find some company or something that I trust, learn about investing as much as I can, and just start putting little tiny bits away and forget it and then live my life because it will happen so much faster. And it, it it's so much easier than we make it. It's, if you make it all complicated in your mind, and I, and I really believe the financial industry wants to make it complicated because that's how they make more money off of you. But if you're going to do this, like robo, I used to think robo investing meant that like, Optimus Prime was like doing my investing for me or something. That's <laughs> like, not what it means. Like... It's not what it means. It just means you don't have to. Yeah. It's, it's you like, you do have to do the robot though every time you put money in. That does. Yes. I feel like for that's those watching part. on YouTube, we are currently doing the robot. So those not watching, <laughs> I should say, those just listening, go on our YouTube so you can see our really bad versions of the robot. <laughs> I'm so awkward. This is actually how I dance. So I feel like I'm <laughs> real dancing. This is, this is not me yeah. being a robot. This is me dancing. <laughs> So I just think it's just a matter of starting and deciding that it's important and freeing yourself up financially so that you can make those decisions, right? Do you want to, do you want to write from anywhere in the world? Do you want to help other people? What do you want to do with this money and and connect to that reason why? And that makes it so much easier when you find $25 laying around, not to order pizza with it and to go, you know what, this is going into my, my future wealth. I love that you said connect to the reason why, because Mm -hmm. I think that that helps me so much. So a couple things that I love what you did. One, that just seems easy. And I didn't think a hundred dollars a month was enough. And I started with like 20 bucks a month. And then I thought about it at the end of the year, that's $1,200. I would never just, I don't psychologically have the capacity to just like hand over $1,200 to my future self. 
but I do have a hundred dollars a month to hand over. It feels less painful yes. in the moment. It's like tricking myself into it. So, and then when I wanted to double it, I didn't double the 200. I just had it pull out twice a month. So I'm still only doing a hundred dollars each time, but now it's twice a month because I couldn't bear to be like, Oh, 200 bucks. But like, that's like, that's, you know, that's pizza or, <laughs> you know, that's yes. money. like, that's money I need. I would convince myself I had to have it right now, but when it came out before I had it, then I just had to adjust and then, um, connect with the reason why one of the greatest things that I think I'm going to give myself lots of credit for a pat on the back that I did with my nieces is we have, um, a gratitude jar and we set up a goal for them. They wanted to go my sister went to England for my mom's 55th birthday. And when she came back, she had a book about England, about Big Ben. And my niece just became obsessed. So I was like, okay, if you want to go, every time you get money, every time you want a toy, every time like Christmas, instead of toys, let's put money in a jar. And we actually saved up and were able to go to London together. And I was working for somebody who was flying me out there. So my expenses were paid and they could stay with me. So it made a big difference. But now we have on our wall, we have a whole um, image of a trip to Singapore. And they, my niece saw Crazy Rich Asians, the movie on the way back from London and was like, our next trip needs to be Singapore. So we have it. And every time they want to, every time they get money for birthdays, every time they get money for anything, they're like, it's going in our Singapore fund. And every time we think about going out to eat, they're like, ah, let's do the Singapore fund instead. And we put, we actually take the money that we would have spent on dinner out and we put it into the gratitude jar and then put that into the Singapore fund. And it has yes. been great for them, but it's been so great for me because now I'm not just like, I rent clothes instead of buying clothes because the extra money can go to the Singapore fund. Like there's so many different yes. things. I've been knowing that Singapore is this place I'm going to. Yeah. feels easier to save for than just like my future self even. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Cause you've connected to the reason why you want to do it. And also you've got like buy-in from, you don't want to disappoint your niece. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> I, there was this moment where my sister and I were like, okay, we live together. This house is really too small for all of us. We have two T te they're turning into teenagers now. Like what do we do? Should we get a bigger home? We could we could use the Singapore fund to buy a bigger home. And the girls were like, what? No, I, I'll share a bedroom for longer if we get to go to Singapore. But it's those things like we would have it. That money just in an account feels different than that money in an account for a goal. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Yes. And <clears throat> you also brought up a good point there about the integrity of money. So once you've given money a name or a, or a job, it's very important that we keep that. So if you've designated a jar of money, let's say for paying off a line of credit and you've gathered up all your coins and every time you find a coin, you put it in the jar and you're like, this is the line of credit jar. You must never take that money and use it for a bottle of wine or something else because you've broken your word with yourself. And that is very important for money integrity. So it's so cool that you brought that up because if you had, you'd be breaking your word with the Singapore. And that just does something as you could see what happened with your nieces energetically. They were like, what are you talking about? This is the thing, right? But as adults, we do that all the time. We say, oh, I'm going to put this money over here for this. And then suddenly we're cashing it out to pay for this over here. Or we, something cool comes up, friends want to go to Vegas and we're, but we're getting out of alignment with what we've said we want to do. So it's so important that we keep our promise to our money, just like we would any other relationship. We want to keep that commitment. When you make any type of commitment, let's say you're having a, a commitment ceremony with the person you love. And I'm like, I, Aaron, take you, Lauren, to be my lawfully wedded wife, unless someone better comes along. You're not going to, we're not going to have a good relationship because you're going to feel like, wait, she's not really in this, right? And same thing with your money. So if you're telling your money, hey, money, I'm going to use you for Singapore, and then you go and use it for something else, money is going to be like, I don't know if this woman can be trusted. So we want to really always make sure that what we say we're going to do with money is actually what we end up doing. That's also one of the ways we build money confidence. So. I love that you brought that up. Yeah. And then we lose confidence ourselves. Like anyone who's yes. ever cheated on somebody or been cheated on, you understand that that's like, that's hard. It's hard. And I feel like I hate the terminology, the way that we talk to women oftentimes, especially like, just don't buy the Gucci bag. Just don't get the latte. Stay at home. Da, da, da. You know, I, I have a, I call it my fuck off feminist fund. It is money I put aside just for splurging. Yes. Every, like a percentage comes in and I just know, 
And that's what's hard when I'm a freelancer, when I money comes and goes out of my life and my business in very unpredictable ways, running my own business and being a writer. But I know that whenever money comes in, here's the percentage that's going to future me. Here's the percentage that's going to fuck off, have fun. Here's the percentage that's going towards my bills. And I will actually make my bills less. My like, oh my God, this has to have, so I can have more fun money. Yes. And it's great. Like it doesn't have to be that you're on this strict life. It can yes. be, and I have access to a lot of privilege and I understand, but I have lived very happily off of $600 a month in the Czech Republic when my rent was $400 a month. When I had $200 a month, I was living the dream life. Like one of the happiest times of my life because yeah. I knew exactly where, like I was saving, like I just had my money together and it was yeah. structured when I've had more money. And it, I was like, Oh, I don't need to be structured with my money. Now I spent it all. I have this belief that you spend whatever you have. And so why not spend it with enthusiasm in ways yeah. you want to versus yeah. just like, I, I consider it similarly to, to diet talk. Like I don't want to count calories, but I also don't want to get so hungry that I eat pizza and I'm gluten and lactose intolerant and I'm going to be really ill and I'm right. really pissed. I ate pizza, you know, like I want yeah. to eat something that actually fulfills and nourishes me and doesn't make me ill. Yes. Yes. And I think, you know, it's such a beautiful point about the not living in that lack mentality, which is like, oh, I have to like scrimp and save and budget and struggle and, you know, count those pennies. Like we do need like your fuck off fund. Like we need, you need a luxury purchase in your mind is I always, no matter what near bankruptcy or in success, always daily tall five pump, not that no water chai tea latte, like come hell or high water. Right. Unless I was like doing some weird challenge or something like that. But <laughs> Um, because I think it's important not to get into that worrisome fear-based lack thing. I do think you have to have structure. Like you're talking about, absolutely. You've got to make sure your bills are covered and that you've got money, you know, for your future self, but not to the detriment of today, not from that place of, I can't have any fun today. I must only, you know, meet this goal because what happens is you take away the joy and you take away the fun and you take away all of the pieces that we, you know, the, the reasons we're alive now, the things that we get to experience and enjoy. So certainly prioritizing for you, what your luxury is going to be, or what your, what your choices are going to be, but making those choices from that place of like, this is my money. This is how I want to handle it, but this is also the future I want. And then figuring out a way to bridge both those things. It's just so empowering. Yeah. So one of my questions I have for you, and as we start to wrap up, I want to know what happens if you're the only one in your life who's interested in this? Like what happens if you're not around people who are, who are having the same money structures and ideals that you want to have? I think that that's quite common, actually. I think it's very rare that you run into, I mean, you can meet certain nerd groups certainly, and you can be a part, we have a community called the get the hell out of debt community. And, you know, we all nerd out on Facebook and various places on the internet together, and it makes it easier. But I know that every one of those people goes home to their life and their partner maybe isn't on board or their friends aren't on board because we just aren't conditioned to talk about money. So it can be very tough, but I think the key is really just finding somebody, whether it be a money mentor or seeking out books or seeking out courses or communities where people are talking openly about this, I think is really important because otherwise what happens is when you're surrounded by people who aren't, you start to feel like it's less important. Like I started hanging around um, people. I have, for some reason, I have three or four friends that are makeup artists. I never wore a stitch of makeup. But now suddenly I'm like, oh, concealer. Oh, this concealer is like, I'm starting to learn things because of the people I'm hanging out with. And so it's the same with money. If you want to get good at it, you've got to hang around people who are good at it or who are at least on a similar path. If you ask me. I love that. And to equate it for writers, if you want to write a book, being around people who are taking their Sunday morning to block out and go write is going yeah. to be different than people who are taking their Sunday morning to go be a mountaineer or yes. to go your dog or to go kite surfing or to watch binge watch TV. Like finding people that have similar goals as you doesn't yeah. mean you have to leave your whole community, but finding those people that have it, that want to, I think one of the best things I did was started surrounding myself with other people who were like, what do I want more than the shiny new toy? 
Yeah. For me, that was traveling. Traveling is always, I pay my future self first and then my travel fund first, even before I pay for food, even before I pay for clothes, even before I pay for makeup, like I pay <laughs> yeah. my travel fund first. And some people would think that's completely ridiculous, but if I'm around people who appreciate travel, they yes. get that the first thing I'm going to be putting money towards. And then when that money is saved, I can actually go spend it without guilt. Yes. Just take it and try to put it towards something like, that feels more responsible as an adult. No, I saved my fuck off. I'm going to fun. I'm going to fuck off. <laughs> I'm going to go to Mexico for a week because I saved up for this and I'm going to feel yeah. okay using it, which is yeah. actually one of the reasons I don't name anything savings. I name it what its goal is because yes. if I call it savings. I'm afraid to actually use it. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love how you name it. I'm picturing you right now on an airplane, like taking all the free pretzels because you're like, you know what I mean? You're like, you're like I, budgeted for this I am trip definitely that here. person who like budgeted for the first class to get to the lounge and I eat all the free food <laughs> and I've got all the snacks and I'm like I don't drink but can you make me a mocktail I love it I don't drink on planes because it makes me nauseous but I definitely am like I'm gonna need a mocktail please you're gonna need to make me something to make me feel bougie what looks like it. champagne <laughs> it won't make me want to vomit when we hit turbulence. Do they have gluten-free snacks on airplanes? They it's must. on the airplane. Yeah. Oh. And, and, uh, Delta, I, that was another thing I started flying when we were flying all around the world going everywhere. I started flying Delta because it had better snack options. Oh, and that see? is real. I love, <laughs> I love that. You know that I'm going to take note of that. Better snack options. <laughs> yeah. Critical, critical, critical for flying. Critical. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I have two last questions for you. And they're questions that I ask everybody in the end. And what is a book? One of the many, I know you're a reader. What is a book that has changed your life? Oh, this is going to be so cliche. And I hate that I'm telling you this. This is going to make, oh, I'm so, I'm not embarrassed by it because it truly has changed my life, but it's so cliche. Awaken the Giant Within by Tony Robbins. <laughs> totally changed my life when I was like in my twenties. And I, I know that that sounds so lame, but it's just, that is one book that I can pick up. And I think this is true for any life-changing book that anybody listening has ever read. Like when you have a book that you can just pick up no matter where you're at in your life and it still feeds you, you you're still learning from it. That book is so old. It's like 25 or 30 years old, but it still stands in a lot of, I mean, there's some politically incorrect language and some, you know, definitely some ways we've learned, but I also, I also like that because it shows us shows me how far we've come when in a time where I think we still have so far to go. So, so I don't mind that as much. So that's definitely a book that, um, I pick up and has changed me no matter what. And then also this is super nerdy, but my husband just wrote a book. Um, it's, you know, not out yet or anything like that, but I have never loved a book more. I had no idea he was as good of a writer. He just in quarantine decided he would write this book. He has a financial planning background. So he's he's, he wasn't a writer before this book. It is the most beautiful thing I've ever read. It was like, I'd been sleeping next to Michael Buble for years and years. And suddenly one day he sang in the shower and I was like, wait a second, are you Michael Buble? Like, it was just so unusual to read. So I would say that book is also, um, my favorite book, but that's also because I think he looks cute naked. So there's that. <laughs> I mean, that does help, right? It does you're, help. You're talking yeah. about your husband, not Tony Robbins. <laughs> <laughs> just making sure. Um, <laughs> Fun fact, I worked um, on the content for that, but I never read that book. So um, You did work yeah. on the, oh yeah, yeah, you did work on the content for obviously, yes, yes, yeah. yes. And so I will have to, well, the content that came out of that, and I know the content, content yeah. well, but I'll yeah. have to go read that book. Um, and also if we're talking about money books, like his money books really helped me with money mindset too. Yes. So that was really helpful. Yes. Um, um, wait, wait, what's your favorite book? Tell me yours, all time. Uh, all time. I would say, so it's not all time favorite, but a book that changed me. I really think that reading the color purple for the first time oh, yes. really like started a DNA shift yes. in every aspect of my life as like a young white girl raised in a conservative town who swore that we were post-racial and like there were yes. just so many aspects of it that just opened my eyes to a world that wasn't anything like mine and um, a world of like sexuality and sensuality, but also domestic abuse and also like Jim Crow era and also slavery. Like there were so many aspects to it. And I was very young when I read it and hadn't been exposed to any conversations similarly to this. And I was like, whoa, my 12 year old self was like mind blown. And that book started me down 
being an avid reader of books that involve people who live life differently than I do. Yes. I love that. I love that. That's your answer first of all, but I also love that 12 year old you was reading the color purple. <laughs> my <laughs> dad, Nancy drew, <laughs> right? Well, my dad had cancer and I didn't know oh. what to do. So I just read, I escaped into to other people's stories. And that's why I love escapism books. Like yeah. anything, I watched the Santa Claus probably a hundred times and read the color purple, like five times and read every book I could get a hold of and watched every movie I could get a hold of. And that's probably why I'm a storyteller now is because I understand how sometimes a story can save us from the hardest moments of our lives. Yes. Oh my gosh. All well. of that. I'm writing all of that down and I'm putting on Canva and I'm making a <laughs> meme. That was so beautiful. <laughs> okay. Then I have another question for you. That's along the same lines. What's a book that you want to read, but not have to write? What's a book that I want to read, but not have to write? Okay. This is too much information. Brace yourself. I'm super into Tantra and I'm super into, um, yeah, I like just that whole presence and, and sensuality and pleasure and all of that. So I would say that would be like, I would be terrible at writing that. I would be like, he put his hand near her twat waffle. Like it would just be, I'm so awkward. You know what I mean? So I love books like that. I love, I love erotica. I love um, just the beautiful work that, oh, I love the work you do. I love just sort of that exploration of those things that aren't talked about normally. Cause I just think that they allow you to think and feel differently. So I don't know. That's a terrible answer, but no, I love that. That's um, a great answer. And jam. I love Tantra too. Barbara Corellis's Urban Tantra, if you haven't read it yet, is a great suggestion. A great I love that you wait, wait in your beautiful non-Canadian accent, you say Tantra. Is that how you pronounce tantra. it? Tantra. Yeah. Oh, tantra. it's so much more beautiful when you say it. Tantra. <laughs> you, like I'm like. You say Tantra? Tantra, like a Canadian. Tantra. I mean, tantra. I don't know. That's probably the, like my Spanish speaker influence, Tantra. But it's more Beautiful when you say it. Yeah, yes. Tantra. So Barbara Corellis's Urban Tantra, if anybody's interested in Tantra, is a great book and open was one of my first Tantra books and opened my mind to it. And Barbara is an amazing human too. So awesome. Yeah. Okay. Well, final, final question is how can people keep learning from you and keep engaging with your brilliant mind and gorgeous, wonderful, hilarious self? You are too sweet. Um, I I don't know. I mean, I'm all over the internet, just at Aaron Sky Kelly. We um, have a, a special, I don't know what you call it now, like a pre-order celebration right now for the book, Get the Hell of Debt, that's coming out. If you pre-order the book, you can get the $99 course for free. It's the book and the course are very similar, but it depends on how you prefer to learn. And if you want a learning community, you just upload your receipt onto getthehelloutofdebt.com and you can take the course for absolutely free and you can get started. And the good news is if you absolutely then hate it and you hate the book, you could just cancel your book order. Before it comes up. But so you it's won't like a money back guarantee because it's amazing. <laughs> but it's like a money back guarantee. So that's probably the best way, especially if you, if you have a lot of debt right now and you're feeling any struggle with it or any shame, or you're just feeling like it's time to be done with it. That's probably the best and easiest way. Yeah, I love it. And I am just a big fan of this book. So I highly suggest going and pre-ordering it because it was such a great, just step-by-step -step easy breakdown of how to both get out of debt and build wealth, which we need more creatives with wealth. We need we more need writers that, that have the ability to take the time off they need to write. As Virginia Woolf yeah. said, to a woman needs money and a room of her own to write and yeah. you all deserve both money and a room of your own and you can get that by getting out of debt and building wealth so please go get yourself a copy of Erin Sky Kelly's book get the you are out. so sweet I also just want to say that I um am such a huge fan I've always been a fan of yours when we worked together you were like my favorite person and Same. so I'm still always slightly mad that you left but regardless <laughs> I'll get over it one day um I just I love first of all I love the title write your freaking book already but I just love that you champion this for people because it truly is it, it's a gift for other people obviously when you write but it really is a gift for yourself just finishing it and so if anybody that I know is listening and you came here because you know me and you're like let's hear what's going to come out of Aaron's mouth today um I want you to follow Lauren and, and pay attention to what she's doing because it's so powerful and she will help you like, she, like take it across the goal line, get her done. And you'll be in community with other writers. And as you and I were talking earlier about the importance of community and doing what it is you're meant to do, being in a community of people who are actively writing is absolutely critical if you want to be an author. 
Well, thank you for all of that. And yes, I love working with authors. So if you are an author listening to this, come on over to the dark yeah. side. We're going to make you write a book and you're going to love it. <laughs> <laughs> true. Yes. So true. Well, thank you so much for coming on here and sharing all your fabulous tips with us. And everybody, please go get yourself a copy of Get the Hell Out of Debt by Erin Sky Kelly. Thank you again, Erin, and I thank will you. see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Hi, everyone. It's Michelle again, Lauren's sister. I'm here to recommend another great book that I'm really enjoying. It is called Trickster, and it is a collection of Native American tales that are made into graphic novels. I've, I'm have i currently reading it, but both of my daughters have already read parts of it. I don't think they've read the whole thing, but they also agree with me that it's really cool. So not only are we learning about Native American myths and legends and getting a little bit of more insight into the different customs and cultures that are a part of our American frame, uh, fabric, but also we get to see them in really cool different artist representations. So they're all really different. So you can see here, this is a story about a raven and it has its own particular artistic style and then we have a story about a raccoon um and just like the different tales um here's another one that's about um different different braves and their protection of um, a deceased person and what their customs are for that particular culture um so you can just see that there are a lot of different artistic styles happening in here and there are a lot of different stories that cover a very wide variety of Native Americans. So it's really great in helping me learn more about different cultures here in America and it's also helping my daughters. So it's it appeals to a wide variety of learners and readers and age groups. So I really highly recommend it. And it's also nice because if you don't have large chunks of time, time where you can just sit down and read for an hour or so, if you only have like 15 minutes, the stories are pretty short. So you can read them as bedtime stories to your children. You can read them as bedtime stories to yourself. Or if you're like waiting in the car for something, you can just have it in there and pick that up. So it's a really versatile book also. So I highly recommend it. Again, it's called Tr Trickster. It's a collection of Native American um, tales in graphic form. So it's really cool. So if you're interested in purchasing this book for yourself or for someone that you love and think might be interested in it themselves, please support your local bookstore by clicking on the link to bookshop.org in our bio or show notes. Okay,